Hyatt's Dwyer. The week of the fight. Today is March the 27th, 2018. And of course, because I believe there's the heavyweight division and then there's everything else, there's the heavyweight champ, and then there's everyone else. I'm talking about the unification match between Anthony Joshua and Joseph Parker. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say this, and I don't say it lightly, right? Let me talk about my own history here. Um, well, the last two big time heavyweight title fights that I've picked, I thought Joshua was a bubble. A bubble, right? Just like the debt bubble affecting all of us right now before his fight against Vladimir Klitschko. I couldn't believe how lucky I was to get Klitschko in that fight. Klitschko was my pick to win the fight. My concern, especially the way Joshua entered the ring to a lot of fanfare and adulation, um, given that the fight was in Joshua's backyard, my concern was that Joshua would get so embarrassed that it would hang over the rest of his career, that he would think about quitting. Well, I was wrong on that fight. Let me be clear on that, right? Now, don't get me wrong. My guy had his moments, as we all know, right? I still am wondering why Vladimir Klitschko picked that fight, of all the fights he's had, to let a guy off the hook after the, guy, after the guy's been dropped to the canvas. But the bottom line is Joshua fought back. Joshua looked good late, while on my scorecard, I still had Klitschko winning the fight before the 11th round. The judges didn't. Many of you didn't, right? I read the comments to the videos here, right? So just understand, I've picked against Joshua in the past. Also, the last fight, just to talk about records here, the last big heavyweight fight, Luis Ortiz against Deontay Wilder. I couldn't believe how lucky I was to get Ortiz, right, as an underdog against Wilder. Then, of course, you hit the infamous round where Ortiz has Wilder so hurt that they actually delayed the next round. Think about it. <laughs> they delayed the start of the next round so that the doctor could look at Deontay Wilder. I'm still wondering how Ortiz didn't leave that fight with the belt. So just to understand, when I analyze fights, I'm really looking for traits. I'm looking at styles, right? And boxing, let's face it, there's a part of boxing that is above and beyond styles. It's where heart comes in, right? Something caused Anthony Joshua, when he gets off the canvas against Vladimir Klitschko, looking finished to stand there and fight back, right? Um, you know, I don't doubt Joshua's heart, but let me say this. I also understand the way the world sees this fight, right? Joshua's a big favorite. Dylan White, who fought and lost to Joshua, feels that Parker has no shot, right, no shot. I believe the quote from Dylan White was that Parker's going to get smashed to bits. David Hay believes that it's Joshua's fight to lose. Okay, fine. But let's fearlessly go wherever the film takes us. I do think a fighter has an edge in this fight. In fact, I'm expecting a stoppage. It's not the way I'm going to bet the fight because of the odds being offered. But understand, I just don't see how someone could look at these two fighters. Look at the speed gap between these two fighters. Right? Look at the athleticism gap between these two fighters. 
Listen to Carlos Tackham, who fought both. Right? I personally feel, and I've said so here online, well before this fight was announced, that I thought Parker lost to Tackham. Right? But listen to Carlos Tackham tell you that while he feels Joshua hits harder, he feels that Joseph Parker's much faster. Right now, the uppercut Joshua threw was one of the best uppercuts I've seen in my life. The one that opens the door for him against Vladimir Klitschko late. Right? But what I want people to realize is that between these two fighters, in my opinion, and I understand this is one man's opinion off at the side. Right? I'm not a heavyweight champ like David Hay has been. I'm not a... Um, I'm not a heavyweight contender like Dylan White is. But the best punch either guy has in this fight, in my opinion, is Joseph Parker's here trigger cross, right cross. Folks, it's, it's here trigger. Right? It's here trigger. Let me just say, I believe the reason this fight is so mispriced because I, I believe Parker wins the fight, the big underdog. I think Parker has at least as much of a chance to win the fight by stoppage as does Anthony Joshua, right? Quite frankly, I'll be surprised if Joshua goes to distance here. But because of the odds, since the casino is giving you better than five to one odds on the Parker side of the play, right? The bet I'm recommending, the conservative hedge, is Parker simply to win, hedged with Joshua by KO. But understand, Joshua is much, excuse me, Parker is much bigger than people realize. He's not the small man in the ring. I know when you see the two guys, Joshua's clearly taller. But Parker's 6'4", folks. 6'4". You know, Parker has fought some fights where he's weighing in the 240s. This is a big man. Parker also fought... And I believe this fight's really a referendum on the heavyweight division. There's some heavyweights who, for some reason, aren't getting the spotlight they deserve. Parker fought an unbeaten heavyweight, Andy Ruiz, who I consider to be much better than fighters like Eric Molina, who has gotten shots against Deontay Wilder and against Anthony Joshua. You know, Andy Ruiz has the fastest hands in the heavyweight division. One man's opinion, I invite you to look at the films. Let me tell you what happened in that Ruiz fight. Joseph Parker starts slow. He has to dig himself out of a hole. Fight is in Parker's backyard. You want to talk about pressure. Right? Dare I say, I feel Joseph Parker had more pressure in that fight than he's going to have in this fight against Anthony Joshua. Right? I know people think I'm crazy. Okay, I'll, I'll roll with the punches. Also understand, in addition to fighting the guy with the fastest hands at heavyweight, if you don't believe me, just look at the film of Andy Ruiz against Joe Hanks when Hanks was unbeaten. When Hanks' nickname was The Future. Right? Understand, Andy Ruiz has one loss. It's to Joseph Parker. Right? Parker also fought the guy with the best footwork in the heavyweight division. Think about it. He fights Mr. Hands. Later, he fights Mr. Feet. And that's Yui Fury. Folks, just based on styles, given that a big part of Parker's game is his athletic dominance, the advantages he has in moving around the ring against opponents. Fury was probably the worst style matchup for him. Now understand, I'm not here being a Parker homer. 
I came online and I picked Fury against Parker. And the fight was close, right? Close but no cigar, right? That's another heavyweight fight for me where my guy had his moments, right? But just understand, Parker shows a level of foot speed in that fight. That Joseph Parker, excuse me, that Anthony Joshua has not approached, right? Parker moves much faster. I mean much faster than Anthony Joshua. Much faster, right? Let me also say too, that if you wanna see Parker's hand speed, because Parker is not just fast, he's two-handed. If you wanna see a two-handed attack, Watch the end of Parker against Franz Botha. Now I'll agree. Botha was well past his prime. Right? But understand whether Botha is past his prime or not, the hand speed caught on tape by Parker speaks for itself. Anthony Joshua can't open up like that. Folks, he just can't. Right? Let me say this too. If you want to see Parker's power, again, that hair trigger, right cross I'm talking about, it's a right cross hook. It's a little of an unorthodox punch. Just look up Parker's win over Bowie Tupu, where he hits Tupu on the top of the head with that punch and Tupu's unconscious before he hits the canvas. To make life easy for everyone, I've actually posted the video of Parker's knockouts in my favorites folder here, right? What I want you to do is to just look at that video and just ask yourself if Parker, again, don't be confused by the level of coordination you're going to see a level of coordination where you're going to think, oh, this guy must be a small heavyweight. He must be what? One of these 6'1 guys who's coordinated and getting by on coordination. Again, the guy is 6'4. The guy weighs in the 240s at times. Right? Both guys are going to come in light for this match. But just to understand, Parker is a guy with a greater than 60% KO ratio who's 6'4", and you're going to see him flashing hand speed. The thing with Parker, and this is a difference between the two guys, right? Parker's not as high volume, believe it or not, as Anthony Joshua is, right? Parker's a guy who shows you flashes, right? He's a flash type guy where you're watching a fight and then suddenly you notice a pile driver jab, right? Pile driver. You notice the hair trigger right hand. You notice the suddenness. He's fighting fans both of them suddenly breaks out with lightning quick combinations. So let me say this. And I believe it's the secret to this fight, and I understand. I understand. Many people believe that Joshua should be favored. Many people have bought into the folklore, and I consider it folklore, that Joshua has fought before huge crowds before, and Parker hasn't. So Parker, who, by the way, already went to the UK, and beat an unbeaten Huey Fury. Parker somehow, in the biggest moment of his life, given that he already has a belt. Has anyone figured this one out? Understand, he's challenging Joshua for Joshua's belts. Joshua's also the challenger. Joshua's challenging Parker for his belt. Right? Parker's already been heavyweight champion. Folks, he has a share of the title right now. But yet, the speculation is that Parker's going to be walking into the ring. He's going to look at a UK crowd 
and suddenly it's going to dawn on him. Oh my God, look at all these people. What am I going to do? Right? Then he's going to hop in the ring and he's going to think, oh my God, it's real. I'm fighting for the heavyweight championship. And then he's going to be frozen against a guy with a perfect knockout ratio. Right? Isn't that the folklore? I think the person who's going to panic is going to be Anthony Joshua. Why do I know this? Because I've seen Joshua at times in fights looking like he's about to hyperventilate. Right? Let's be real. Joshua is totally spent in the middle of that Vladimir Klitschko fight. He had to catch a second wind, didn't he? Right now, by contrast, understand, Parker is such a superior athlete that he comes back against Andy Ruiz. Right? He closes strong against Carlos Tackham. I still thought he lost the fight, but understand, Parker is a guy who not only has gone 12 before, by the way, as I make this video, Anthony Joshua has never gone 12. But Parker actually wakes up in the later rounds. Right? He's the better athlete. Also, you look at Parker. And Parker is a guy who's always calm and collected. The way he decided to fight Carlos Tackham almost looks suicidal. There are times where Parker has his hands down and Tackham, who's awkward, is throwing power shots at weird angles. And Parker's just walking back on his back foot. As you watch the fight, you're cringing. You're thinking, wow, doesn't Parker realize that Tackham has taken guys out? That Tackham has knockout power. But yet Parker is incredibly calm. Folks, anyone who saw the last three rounds of the Fury-Parker fight in the UK sensed the tension, understood that that fight was close, could have gone either way. But yet Parker delivered at the end of that fight, didn't he? Right? Parker's not hyperventilating. He's not panicked. It's a personality thing. Right? This is the guy who always looks calm. Folks, look at the facial expression Joseph Parker has on his face in his highlights. So, I'll just say this. I see a hair trigger right cross. Parker also has a hair trigger left hook. You can't teach these things. Right? He's sudden. You know, the uh, Bowie Tupu KO, one minute Bowie Tupu is there, he's 100%. The next minute, he's out. Now, I believe Joshua is a different personality type. Right? Joshua is a very good counterpuncher. But Joshua is the guy who needs the sun to be out before he hops in the car and drives. Right? He's not a guy who's going to push the issue. When did he catch up with 30-something-year-old Vladimir Klitschko? In the later rounds, when Vladimir Klitschko started to tire. Now, let's not be confused about that fight. Klitschko goes into that fight after losing to Tyson Fury and then after a long layoff. Right? Let's remember, too, before Klitschko loses to Tyson Fury, Brian Jennings takes Vladimir Klitschko the distance. Now, the Vladimir Klitschko we might remember running roughshod over the heavyweight division for years, right? Knocking out Tony Thompson twice etc. That Vladimir Klitschko might not have been the Vladimir Klitschko that Anthony Joshua faced. Let me say this too. And to the press, you can talk to Dylan White yourself. I thought the first round of Dylan White against Joshua was intriguing. 
right? Dylan White comes out. He's moving. He's not intimidated by Anthony Joshua. He's popping a jab. Then something happens, doesn't it? Right? Joshua doesn't jump on Dylan White. Joshua waits for Dylan White to slow down a little bit. Then Joshua is able to muscle Dylan White over to the ropes. Spectacular knockout. Right? My point to you is simply, given that Joshua throws more punches than the average heavyweight, given that Joshua is tentative, given that Joshua keys off his jab, which I don't think he's going to be able to land against Joseph Parker. There's a reason why, after all of these fights, Joseph Parker looks unmarked. Isn't there a bit of a Mike Tyson thing going on here? I remember I saw Tyson against Buster Douglas, and me and my crew were all amazed to see Tyson with a swollen eye. Up until that point, we had never even seen Tyson with a swelling. Folks, that's how it's been for Joseph Parker. He moves well. He knows how to get out of the way of jabs. Yui Fury is an excellent jabber. Excellent jabber. Look at the copy box numbers for that Fury Joseph Parker fight. Fury hardly lands any jabs on Joseph Parker. Right? So the question for me here, and I understand there's a lot of chin talk and all this other stuff. Right? But the question for me here is what happens if Joshua can't land the jab and can't get his timing? Right? Think about it. Vladimir Klitschko came hunting for Joshua. Right? The guys Joshua fights, you know, Carlos Tackham. You know, Carlos Tagum is in there to land his punches. You don't have the kind of episodic opponent, the kind of guy who throws less punches on average than Joshua, but who's going to wait for openings and who's going to be outside and then who's going to leap in with punches like a hair trigger right cross and a hair trigger left hook. Right, guys who have a decided hand speed advantage. If Parker wants, he can channel either Larry Holmes, right, come in, just bludgeon, just bludgeon Joshua with a jab. I know Joshua has a pretty good jab. You saw it in the Tackham fight. But Tackham's a mobile compared to Parker. A mobile. Right, Parker literally could come in, pick an entry spot, hit him with three or four left hands, get back out. Do that enough, this fight might start looking like the Dylan White-Lucas Brown fight. But understand, Joshua has the hand speed to also channel Ray Leonard. Right? What I want people to do is to look at Ray Leonard's KO percentage. Ray Leonard's a combination puncher. So what Ray would do is Ray would be outside then these big guys, right, would, you know, drop their defense a little or not be prepared. Then Ray would jump in both hands blazing, which is exactly what Joseph Parker does against Franz Botha. Right? So, I think Parker hits hard, right? How do I know? Just look at Bowie Tupu. Right, folks? I understand the last knockdown in the Demetrenko fight's a little bit questionable. Demetrenko's on the canvas, gets tapped in the ribs, and oh, he looks like Bernard Hopkins looked uh, when Joe Calzaghe grazed his uh, below-the-belt area. Okay, okay, you could say that looks questionable. What about the knockdowns of Demetrenko before that last knockdown? Right, Parker is sudden. Parker knocks guys down. Right? Parker stops fights. 
If he weren't fighting a guy with a 100% KO ratio, we'd be looking at Parker's KO ratio and saying, oh, he's a clear puncher. Right? Also, at what point does hype become too much hype? Right? You know, this is boxing. If you have too much of an upper body, guys are going to make you pay, especially when you don't know how to hide it. Right? Joseph Parker is an accomplished body puncher. Right? He throws a lot of lefts to the body. Now, all I'm saying to the cognoscente here is how many fights have you seen where Anthony Joshua bends at the waist? Right? Tell me the fight where Anthony Joshua bends his knees and bends down, goes into a crouch. What, what fight is that? Isn't Joshua a little bit too tall and a little bit too stiff and a little bit too hand speed slow? Right? Too not sudden for Joseph Parker. So, look, I admit I've been taking the wrong guy in these fights. Right? Not that the Klitschko fight was a mismatch or... The um, or the Wilder Ortiz fight was a mismatch. My guys have had their moments. Um, I'm trying to ignore the Lucas Brown disaster against um, against Dylan White, but let's just say this, right? Based on styles, in my opinion, this Parker Joshua fight is completely mispriced. You don't have to believe me. What I want you to do is to look at the highlights yourself. Which opponent of Anthony Joshua's fights like Joseph Parker? Please don't tell me Eric Molina. Please don't tell me Carlos Tackham. Right? So, I like Parker in this one. I think he's misprized. The conservative hedge is to take Parker to win. Folks, you're getting better than 5 to 1 odds. Hedged with Joshua by KO. If you're a bit more of a daredevil, consider taking Parker to win. Hedged with the under 8.5 rounds. Understand, the vast majority of Anthony Joshua's fights finish inside of 8.5 rounds. Understand, even Vladimir Klitschko slipped up during their fight and hits the canvas before Anthony Joshua does. What I want people to look at though is after Klitschko gets up off the canvas, he actually continues to fight Joshua. Joshua's unable to drop him a second time until the 11th round. Now it's when Joshua tries to open up after knocking Klitschko down that Joshua is in an unnatural area. He has a problem trading with another heavy-handed guy. And that's when he gets dropped. Right? My point to you is Joshua is the more active fighter of these two, but Parker is going to bring a pace. He's going to bring movement that Joshua hasn't seen before. Right? Movement and speed. Joshua is going to have to get out of his comfort zone to compete, right? When a guy is moving around the ring, as practically every opponent of Muhammad Ali's knows, when a guy is moving around the ring and he's popping you with a jab, you got to do something, right? You got to find a way to cut off the ring on the guy. You can't allow the guy to bust you up for 12 rounds just dancing around winning rounds and popping a jab. Let me close, too, by saying there's a Boxing Hall of Famer, Azuma Nelson, everyone should know about. And he had a philosophy. He said, man, I'd rather fight on the road than at home. Right? His philosophy was, hey, on the road, no one's nagging you for tickets. <laughs> right? The local press, the local press doesn't know you. Right? They know your opponent. The opponent has all the pressure of the tickets, the local press, the expectations, right? You're just the out-of-towner visiting. Are you sure? 
that the person facing the most pressure is the out-of-town visitor who has already won a big fight in the UK against an unbeaten Huey Fury. Don't you think the guy with the pressure might actually be the 2012 Olympic champion, he won the Olympics in London, right? Who's fighting at home and who people are building up to be the next great heavyweight, right? I think there's a hell of a lot of pressure right now on Joshua, especially since he knows, he knows that Joseph Parker is coming in the ring with a greater than 60% KO ratio, that Joseph Parker is more mobile than anyone he's faced, that Joseph Parker is actually 6'4". He's a big man, much bigger than Carlos Taco. So this is another fight where I'm taking the underdog hedged with the favorite by KO. Let me also add, too, that for those of you who think I'm addicted to taking underdogs, far from it, right? I'm taking Golovkin again against Canelo. By the way, that's another fight that gets my goat. I had Golovkin the first time. Okay, I'm not going to complain about the scoring there. Let's just say some of these fights, you know, you watch the fight, you say, oh, great. Then they announce the scoring and you're like, you got to be kidding. Okay, whatever. I'm not going to cry over spilled milk. But just to understand, I do take favorites when I believe the favorite has an edge. It should tell you a lot about the heavyweight division. That this is the second big fight in the United Kingdom where I'm taking Joshua's opponent. Right? I took Klitschko before. I'm taking Parker. Right? This should also tell you a lot when... Deontay Wilder's unbeaten, right? And I took his opponent. I still feel the heavyweight division somewhat is up for grabs. Don't lose sight of Andy Ruiz. Don't lose sight of Yui Fury. Don't lose sight of Tyson Fury. Expect upsets. I'm expecting one here. I like Joseph Parker to win the fight. I'll hedge the play with Joshua by KO. That's how I see it. Dylan White and David Hay, they're spending their money. I'm going to spend mine this way. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. And if you want to discuss Klitschko, Joshua, uh, even the Deontay Wilder, Luis Ortiz fight, please feel free to do so in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.